How many fist bumps did you and Howie get? 380. 380. Th Howie and in, I in got how long? Th 30 seconds. 380 fist bumps? I was moving so fast. Can we beat it? Can we beat the record or yeah. get it on camera? Yeah, can we beat it? Gentlemen, we will begin in three, two, one. My name is David, record breaker Rush. Are you a, actually a record breaker? I have broken over 250 Guinness World Records titles. What? David Rush is an engineer from MIT, but that's not how most people know him. And that was terrifying. Woohoo! Record breaker Rush, as he's known, is attempting to become the Guinness World Record holder for holding the most Guinness World Records. He's pushed his body to the extreme to set records that require incredible endurance, including his success in juggling three balls for the longest time in recorded history. That's over 13 hours. I wanted to speak to David about how he's handled the incredible strain he's put on his body, as well as his remarkable relationship with failure. I've yet to meet someone who's as passionate about learning from failure as David. Make sure to stick around through the end of this interview where David and I actually make our official attempt at breaking our own Guinness World Record. For now, help me to welcome record breaker David Rush to the Checkup Podcast. I've had on my podcast goats of soccer, all-stars of NBA, NFL, boxing champions. Now, is it true that I have the goat a failure in front of me? Uh, yeah, I think you're <laughs> I right. Thought you, were gonna, you thought I was going to go the wrong direction. <laughs> no, no, I was. I mean, that is much more what I am attuned to because I am used to failing over and over and over again. And this is what I speak to about audiences. Now, I used to work in tech for 13 years. Now, I'm a keynote speaker talking about failure does not define you. How you respond to it does. Sure. And take us through your journey of learning to love failure, because I feel like that's what you're leading by example with. I mean, nobody loves failure, but figuring out how to respond to it, because when you fail, you want to crawl into a hole and disappear. You want to avoid it. You don't, it's very uncomfortable. And so as we grow up, you know, a kid learning to walk, they stand up, all they know is falling down. Yep. And every time they fall down, they get back up and they get back up. And at some point, I think in our lives, we become successful at so many things that we don't have to do the things we're not good at anymore. Yep. And so we stop doing those things. I think I see this quite often with young physicians and older physicians and see the, the drastic differences between the two, where young folks are so evidence-based. They want to go by the book. They want to do the right thing. And then they become so rigid that they go by the book where they stop thinking about the individual sitting in front of them and the experience that they could bring to that person. On the other hand, you have the older physicians that are pure experience. I don't care what the book says. I've been doing this for 40 years, so I'm not changing. But in your world, you actually welcome that change and it shapes you to set some amazing, um, not just barriers for yourself, but world records at this point. Right? Mm -hmm. How many world records do you have in the moment? So I've broken about 300 Guinness World Records titles. Wow. And I currently hold about 160. So you, there's 140 where someone has surpassed you. How often does that happen? I'm curious. So I've been breaking records for about eight years, and um, it happens on a regular basis. I've lost about half the records I've broken wow. so far. And who tracks this? Like, I, I know obviously Guinness World Records tracks it, but like, are there individuals who are like, oh, that's a record I want to attempt, that's a record. Are you all in the same community? Yeah, well, I mean, in, in a community, we don't all know each other. We know okay. of each other, and we've, okay. I've had conversations with several of them. But there's this community of what are called super record breakers. They go out there <laughs> and they try to break as many records as they possibly can. <laughs> and do you guys like sit in a group chat on a WhatsApp group chat and say like, oh, you suck. I can do that for, I can break that real easy. No, I've, I've just had a few like maybe an email conversation or an Instagram message back and forth. And there's a couple of my men in person, but for the most part, we just know of each other. Got it. Okay. So it's a yeah. supportive, nurturing environment. I mean, it's a, uh, we're uh, respectful to each other, but it's definitely competitive. <laughs> okay. That's exciting. <laughs> and how does one enter the space you've been doing it for eight years to start saying, I'm going to be the world record, uh, world record breaking champion. So I, I, it didn't start that way for me. I mean, I've been promoting STEM education for the last 15 years as science, technology, engineering, and math, talk about how I wasn't smart enough to get into the gifted program in the Idaho public education system. And yet through hard work, I eventually went off to MIT and got my electrical engineering degree. And uh, I was invited to talk to students about what was your journey like? And educators like, did this? Did the educators in Idaho prepare you for the academic rigor of MIT? And I said, yeah. And I came and gave a talk. 
but I'm like, I'm not just going to give a talk. I like to entertain people. I'm a juggler, so I'll juggle while I do it. <laughs> and so I did that, and it, the response was great. So I did another talk and another talk. And so this is while working in a technology startup in Boise. And after, you know, it kind of snowballed from there. And after 13 years, we were uh, had the largest technology exit in Idaho's history. Wow. And so this what last was the year, company? Uh, Cradle Point. So a networking company, wireless routers. I was a product manager, mm -hmm. which is, you know, kind of the, I didn't even know it existed. But after I got my MBA, I'm like, this is what I want to do mm -hmm. because it's the intersection of technology, sales, uh, converting, you know, sales requirements. What does the industry want into technical requirements? And then telling the engineers like, this is what we need to build. Can you figure us, can you help me figure out how to build it. And so I'm the in between the technical sales, uh, you know, inter interacting with marketing and finance. And so you're the, the entire router. company. Hmm? You're the router. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, right? the hub of all yeah, that putting together. Exactly. And then, uh, and then, so in 2022, I left my job in tech to become a full note, full time keynote speaker. How does the, like, how do you make that transition? Uh, so I mean, you've got to have the base to start from. I've had 15 years of public speaking experience. Mm -hmm. And then I had the financial stability of like, I can quit my job in tech now and do what I want. Wow. Uh, what do I want to spend my time doing? And so I have three young kids at home as well. So a five and a seven-year-old boy and a one-year-old girl. And so three days a week, I'm full-time at home with my one-year-old girl while my wife's off being a mechanical engineer at HP. <laughs> wow, so, okay. so we've got, <laughs> um, so, it, and it starts with having a supportive wife, supportive family. Jennifer is a amazing and she's participated in many records and also been the support staff for hundreds of them at this point so I, I couldn't do it without her obviously family is important to you the idea of increasing engagement in the stem community what did you feel was going on that there wasn't as much engagement in the STEM community? What did you want to change? So he, there's there's a couple things there. One is the awareness of a lot of the jobs in today's economy are mm -hmm. driven by STEM careers. Understanding programming. How does the world work? You got AI, self-driving cars, rockets going to the moon, uh, or you know, trying to go to the moon. In which case, I was sitting <laughs> next to the folks that were uh, sending the last. I mean, trying to send something to the moon, and there was a fuel leak in it. And so a few days later, I'm like, ah, it didn't make it. But um, there's the economy part driving need for STEM careers, but here's the, the bigger piece that goes into it. You know, a student will struggle with math or fail a scientist and say, I can never become an engineer because they don't believe they can. And so what I'm trying to promote is having a growth mindset and pursuing their goals with grit. Because as Angela Duckworth says, the number one predictor of success isn't past success. It isn't academic um, achievement. It isn't SAT scores. It isn't even socioeconomic status. It's grit. It's not giving up when you fail. That is the number one predictor of success across, you know, trying to become a Green Beret, a Spelling Bee contestant, or a serial world record breaker. And that mindset, how do you incorporate it into your presentations when you do speak? Yeah. So <laughs> grit is not giving up when things get hard. Okay. And so it's a story-based approach of you know, when I tried to break my first world record, it was for the, it was going to be the fastest half mile run while juggling. And so half I mile. spent the next two years training for this. This is before I ever broken a, a record because I, I was speaking to folks and I'm like, how do I create this tangible example that if you set your mind to a goal that you've set with guts, pursue it with grit and a growth mindset, you can accomplish virtually anything. And I'm like, I've always wanted to break a Guinness World Records title. I never believed I could, but you know, if I'm talking about this, I need to make it happen. Yeah. So I spent the next two years training. I ran over 2,000 miles while juggling. Wow, 2,000? Yeah, over a couple of years. I mean, it was short runs, long runs. I was wind sprints, time trials. I was running to my legs burned and my lungs were on fire and I kept running more because I, I believed I was gonna break this world record. And I vastly overestimated the accolades a single world record would bring. <laughs> so that self-delusion <laughs> propelled me. <laughs> and what does it take to run fast but juggle at the same time? Is it coordination? Is it endurance? What changes in, in that? So, so honestly, the actual uh, act of joggling, as it's called, isn't as counterintuitive as you might think. Because when you're running and running, you're doing this. Yeah. And your arms are pumping with this motion. And so it's actually easier to run and juggle uh, than it is to walk and juggle. Interesting. Because the arm motion, when you time it right, isn't so bad. And it started actually when I was in college. A little side story here. In 2005, uh, my brother invited me out to Seattle to spend Thanksgiving with him, with my other brother. And I booked the tickets and was flying out. And he said, oh, by the way, I'm running the Seattle Half Marathon that weekend. 
Nice. I'm, the, I'm the competitive younger brother. Okay. There's no way I'm going to go visit him and he run a half marathon and I don't do it. <laughs> so I had time to take exactly two training runs okay. <laughs> before I go out. And I took a five and a seven miler around the Boston bridge loop system that they've mm-hmm. got there. But I was like, I don't just want to run this. I want to juggle while I do it. Because I knew about juggling, but I'd never done it before. So I took two juggling runs. <laughs> and the first time I dropped it a bunch of times. The second time, maybe only three or four times. So I'm like, I can do this. Uh, and then the day of the half marathon in Seattle, it snowed. It doesn't ever snow oh in Seattle. God. Hands are absolutely frozen. And I'm like, I don't, I don't think I can wear gloves while I do this. I'm too afraid. So my fingers actually like just went numb. They oh were so God. cold in the first three miles. Every time the ball hit them, it was like, you know, that shooting, spiking pain. Yeah. I don't even know what's called. I'm sure there's a medical <laughs> term for it, but it hurt like crazy. But after about three miles, I warmed up. Ended up drawing, uh, dropping the balls only three times including in the football stadium at the finish. So everybody knew that I didn't know actually, they, they, they thought I never actually juggled half marathon. Um, and from there, I, I've been juggling ever since. So it's not, it's not that difficult once you know how to juggle and can run and juggle at the same time. When you say it's not that difficult, I find it hard to wrap my head around that, given the fact that I struggle to go and run five miles and I'm a professional athlete myself and you're doing it and you're like, oh, I'm just joggling and I did it after two training runs and my fingers were falling off. I had frostbite, but it's not that hard. You know, this, I should, I should preface that I've been juggling since I was eight <laughs> and I started the MIT student juggling club. So I juggled hundreds of oh hours at God. that point. So <laughs> how many members were there of the MIT juggling club? You know, actually we had over 300 what? on the roster. Yeah. 300. Yeah. Is there a club for anything or is this like a known like is is a is there a juggling community? Oh, there's absolutely juggling community. In fact, there's the the MIT juggling club, which kind of has merged with the student one at this point, has been the it's the longest continuously operating drop in juggling club in the world. It's been around since the 1970s with Arthur Lubel created it. So every Sunday in lobby 10 under the Great Dome at MIT, you can go there from I think three to five p.m. and there's going to be jugglers there, and there have been for the last almost 50 years. That's incredible. What started the movement? Like, how did people get into juggling? Like, I, I guess, historically speaking. I mean, juggling's been around for thousands of years. I mean, I think there are depictions of blindfolded juggling from, you know, Chinese books and or Chinese writing from 2500 BC of like seven sword blindfolded juggling depicted wow. in these pictures. Now, I don't think they actually juggled seven swords blindfolded because, <laughs> I mean, I've got the uh, world record for longest duration juggling blindfold and three balls is pretty difficult. And I'm one of the, you know, <laughs> seven, seven, seven swords blindfolded it isn't physically possible, I don't believe. All right, so I got to ask this. <clears throat> when I go to a party, everyone's yeah. like, oh, Dr. Mike, can you tell me what's this rash? Dr. Mike, can you tell me why my back hurts? Dr. Mike, I heard this thing. It's a miracle weight loss pill. And they ask me those questions. How often are people accosting you to start juggling? Um, not start juggling so much because juggling is maybe a little passe in those uh, okay. scenarios. But to ask about the world records, like uh, what's the latest? What are you it. working on now? So they're that not asking all. to see it? Uh, you know... That's my, incredible to me. Yeah. <laughs> so the parties I go to are with my close friends. Okay, They've seen it, it already. Okay, they so don't want to see it anymore. They're like, all right, I got it. <laughs> 13 hours of you juggling. I've seen it. I got it. Uh-huh. Did you record that 13-hour uh, juggling session? Because that is the world record of juggling, right? Yeah. So the two ways you can validate a Guinness World Records title, one, you could have the adjudicator on site, which I've done several times with you know TV shows and big public events. The other route, you can actually do it completely free. You can create a free account on guinnessworldrecords.com, uh, apply for a record for free, they'll send you the rules, and then you make an attempt. And to, to have that be validated, for, you have to have independent witnesses, timekeepers, video evidence, photograph evidence, sometimes specialty evidence, submit it off the Guinness, they'll approve it. So in this case, I had to record the whole thing wow. continuously from four different cameras because if one dies, I want to make sure it's recorded. <laughs> and obviously 13 hours without a bathroom break, that's hard. How do you do that? So uh, I, this was one of the reasons it took me so long to make the attempt because like, how am I going to ha- have this happen? So um, the previous record was 12 hours, five minutes. So that's what I need to, to, to break. So um, I need to fill out food, water, bathroom, all that logistics, and then not mess up for 13 or 12, and 12 hours, five minutes. That was the record. Uh, previous record is 12 hours, five minutes. So the okay. first time I make the attempt, I'm three and a half hours into the attempt. And I'd set it um, three weeks before my wife's due date because I'm like, that's as close as I want to get. I don't want to risk this getting interrupted. And three and a half hours in the attempt, Wife text from the hospital. No. <laughs> to the neighbor who was there, not coming home until we have a baby. And uh, it took me, I'm a little embarrassed to say, probably, I think, nine minutes <laughs> to come to the realization I cannot wait another nine and a half hours before I go to the hospital. <laughs> okay. Um, so that was attempt number one. That was attempt number one. Uh, uh, 
Attempt number two. Was there a baby in hand? There was a baby in hand. Yeah, okay. it was a several months la- or several months later. Yeah, to it. let okay. the baby newborn. So my wife was then support staff for the next attempts, and she was super, super supportive, helped me out, knew my needs, okay. um, and couldn't have done it without her. So attempt number two, I'm I'm there juggling. I'm ten hours, fifty three minutes in the attempt. Two balls collide, drop to the floor. Attempt over. And what 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 happened? Why did they collide? No! Just 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 I'm arm d- just miscalculation just yep uh, one throw just a little bit off the balls nicked couldn't recover sometimes i can recover from a, a, a knock but they're just, the, and i'm just screaming i'm like are I can't you in tears you're so close i mean just my hand head in my hands being like i can't believe i just watched titanic flew across the atlantic and i've got nothing to show for it <sighs> i mean just absolute devastation that's painful and then what were you doing to solve all those logistical issues because 10 hours is a long time. I mean, it's a, a really long time. So what I decided is I would wear a you know adult diaper. Okay. I uh, tried to restrict my fluid intake. And then for uh, number two there, I, I took uh, you know anti-diarrheal pill. No way. I don't know if that's a good idea, but I... Uh, <laughs> I don't recommend. <laughs> Were you having diarrhea at the moment? No, 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 not. It was just so I didn't have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> to make sure I wouldn't have to go to the bathroom Got that it. day. Okay. Yeah. And then do you have a cup of coffee? Do you... So I try to avoid caffeine. Okay. Because um, that makes you want to go pee. And yeah. Poop. Avoid caffeine. And, and I usually have caffeine in the morning, so avoid caffeine. I think that might have contributed to some of the dizziness I was having that day. Mm. But mostly it was those balls going around in the infinity pattern back and forth. Because I was getting... That's ver- hypnotizing. I was getting vertigo. Yeah. And so I actually you know, alternate between looking at the balls, looking through the balls at the, the floor, and then looking at all the cameras to make sure the red lights are flashing. And then I had a clock running, look at the clock to see where I am. Because I'm because if, if I stare at the balls the entire time, I'll just get so dizzy. I fall over. Wow. Wow, I didn't even think about that. And mm-hmm. then what about um, hydration during or food during? Or is someone feeding your yeah. Snickers bar off to the side? So the first time I did it, I, I had food and water off to the side, like bananas and, you know, PDB and J sandwiches and water with the straw and some electrolyte solution with the straw. Uh, but it was too distracting to move the stuff in front of my mouth, blocking the arms. I just didn't want to deal with that pressure. So the next attempts, I wore a Camelback. Mm. So in the Camelback, Got the hose in my mouth the entire time with the straw. And then what I chose was high protein chocolate milk okay. and protein powder. Okay. And so I, I, you know, over 13 hours, probably drank about 3,000 calories worth of that during the attempt to provide hydration and, and calories. Wow. That's really hard. I could also see if you were restricting fluid before, that can contribute to some dizziness and fatigue and coordination. Yeah. Did you struggle with that while you were doing it? I, I did a little bit. So attempt number two. I am uh, um, 10 hours and 23 minutes in the attempt. Oh my God. And then there was a ball on the floor. Wait, so the second attempt? 10 hours and 23 minutes. And I'm standing there being like, why is there a ball on the floor? I was so delirious. I didn't understand why there was a ball on the floor. Because you're still throwing up three balls. No, I only had two balls. I have two balls. I've, so I've, 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 I've dropped a ball. And I was just so dizzy, delirious, uh, vertigo, and, and you know, 10 and a half hours of doing the exact same thing over and over. And I'm like, why? So I failed this time too. So what I did is I watched the video back. And I didn't understand why I dropped the ball. <laughs> Watch it in slow motion. Still don't know what's going on. Frame by frame analysis. My right hand has a ball in it. I'm juggling. It comes up with a ball. But your hand doesn't let go. It doesn't let go. And it comes back down. And it just hits the other ball. After 125,000 throws, I forgot to throw a <laughs> you, ball. You counted the throws? How do you know it's 125,000? So, I, you know, I count a minute worth of throws oh. and then I multiply. A, a minute throughout So it's an the estimate. Attempt. Yeah, it's an estimate. Okay. And, I, and I can get a pretty good estimate because I count one minute and then an hour in, two hours in, five hours in to make sure. Because the, the speed varies over time mm-hmm. to get a pretty good estimate of how many throws I made. Got it. And then what was the successful attempt? How many... So, uh, so the at first, that point, are you like, what's your mindset after fail? So the first time I did it, I was like, I want to go after this right away, but I'd actually torn a muscle in my arm because of 10, almost overuse. 11 hours of juggling overuse. So I couldn't make that attempt right away. And I had a baby <laughs> in hand, so it sure. took several months to heal up. Okay. Second attempt, 10 hours, 23 minutes in fail. I'm like, I want to go after it right away. I schedule an attempt right away a week later. My wife's like, I just spent all day watching all the kids, <laughs> taking care of everything, <laughs> and, and you want to do it again? I'm like, yes, I do. Thank you, honey. Um, so it was just a week later for this fourth attempt. So the fourth attempt, <laughs> I'm getting to that 10 and a half hour mark, and I'm so nervous mm. because this is where I failed the other two times. My arms are like shaking, which is the most likely reason to cause me to juggle. <laughs> sure. And I'm like, don't, don't shake. Make it 11 hours, 11 and a half. 
And when I get close to that 12 hours, I'm just staring at these balls going back. Normally, I'm a little bit more relaxed, but I'm just so oh, yeah. uptight, staring going back and forth. I don't know where I am. The eyes are just delirious. I'm getting that vertigo sense. And then finally, uh, it's way after my kids' is bedtime, but <laughs> my wife let them stay up. And my, my seven-year-old says from the corner of the room, congratulations, daddy, you passed the record. And I was like, yes, I finally did it. Do so you just to, throw the balls on the floor? No, then? I was able to relax, enjoy it, and I juggled another hour and five minutes. Isn't it crazy how much our mental fortitude and our mental state contributes to our performance? I mean- Because at hour 11, you were fading. You would think by you know hour 12 and a half, you would be more sore, your muscles would be more fatigued. But because the pressure came off and the excitement came out, suddenly got easier. I mean, the mind controls the body. And I mean, like, that's a perfect example. Yeah. Because there's no other way. And I have patients come in. This is, you're obviously a story of uh, performance. They have issues with uh, injury, let's say. Mm -hmm. They will tell me, you know, when I'm having a good time, my pain doesn't bother me. But when I'm stressed out at work, it really bothers me. It's like, well, if you had a tear in your muscle or your rotator cuff wasn't working, it doesn't just pick times where it works. This is something that's clearly being influenced by the mental health state, which we then talk about, we address the mental health concerns, and then suddenly the pain gets better. But we didn't actually fix anything anatomically, and it goes to show the power of the mind and body connection. Mm -hmm. So you're the prime example of it from the performance aspect and why we have sports psychologists on yeah. all the major teams. For sure. Do you ever have to um, consult a sports psychologist or a mental health specialist? You know, I thought about it because uh, one of the things I really struggle with is anxiety mm -hmm. related to blindfolded juggling. Those, okay. those two things Specifically. go to. And, and the reason is it's cause it was a, a traumatic event early in my career. I, I broke my first world record in 2015. And in 2016, I got invited onto the Today Show in here in New York City. Uh, I found it. It's live national television. And... So I come out here. It's the first time I've ever on TV and the last for all I know. Because at this point, I'm not a serial record breaker. I've only got like two. Um, and I'm like starstruck. Like, I can't believe this is happening to me. This is the coolest thing ever. So I get out there on the front of the three big cameras. Hoda introduces me. And it's for the world's fastest blindfolded juggling. The most juggling catches in one minute while blindfolded. Mm -hmm. This is one of the records I've broken. So I actually owned the record and I could beat it in 45 seconds. But I practiced so much that my goal wasn't just to break that record. I was going to become, this is what I had in my, I was going to become the world's fastest juggler, period, on this show, while blindfolded, breaking that record as well. And I'd practice so much I knew I could do it. I get in front of those bright lights, Hoda introduced me, put the blindfold on, the Guinness adjudicator with the clipboard says, for the record books, three, two, one, go. And I start juggling. About 15 seconds in, it's like a bear jumped out of me. Heart rate spikes, oh. adrenaline surges through the body. My arms turn to spaghetti and I dropped a ball. Did I think this might happen? Sure. In fact, I'd practice so much. I didn't even have to take the blindfold off. I could hear where the ball dropped based on sound, reach down, picked it up. Let's go again. So I'm like, okay, just a hiccup. Start again. 20 seconds in, that bear jumps out at me again. I dropped the ball again. Devastating. This time I have to take out the blindfold, pick up the ball. I'm jumping around, let, let, just nerves. I say, on, on, just trying to calm myself, just nerves, let's do it again. And the hosts are like, is he allowed to do it again? The, they're asking the adjudicator. I didn't know if I was allowed to do it again. They didn't know if I was allowed to do it again. What I did know at this point, that is live TV. If they don't let me do it again, they're going to look like jerks. <laughs> so they let me do it again. Got it. So I, I get the blindfold on. I'm starting juggling. This time, I'm, I know I'm so nervous. I'm, I gave up on the world's fastest juggling period. I'm just going to break the world record they know I'm there to break. Because mm -hmm. all I have to I, I could do it in 45 seconds. All I have to do is finish the minute. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 seconds. And I can still get my, I can feel myself getting nervous. My arms are getting shaky. I'm just hold it together. Just keep juggling. You'll be fine. 35 seconds, 40 seconds in, drop the ball again. Oh my God. I wanted to crawl in a hole and disappear. Just absolutely devastated. That the How biggest are the shot hosts of my life. Reacting? Oh, they're very apologetic. There was a consolation prize. I got a hug from Hoda. <laughs> <laughs> but that's gotta feel terrible. Like Yeah, and and I can hear the production crew talking, just like, oh yeah, you can't break all the records. You know, sometimes you gotta uh, show that it's difficult. And they're just talking about me as I'm not there. I'm like, yep, I'm the guy that failed this week. Uh -huh. And so ever since then, anytime I put a blindfold on him, juggling for a record, I get super nervous. Other records, not so much. I've been America's Got Talent a couple times. Those records, much less pressure because they weren't like performance-based ones where I have to move super fast. And if I can't see them and I get nervous, I fail. Yeah.
Wow. So it's like in that specific setting, you feel it come on. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen professional stunt folks who have done the most incredible feats. And then sometimes something triggers inside of them. I remember there was, I think it was the highest jump. Have you heard about that? Mm -mm. Where it was like the highest free fall jump off a parachute with a parachute. And the person jumping was so afraid to jump even though they've done the most incredible feats, for some reason, just couldn't do it, just couldn't step off the platform. Hmm. And it made no sense, but it really highlights how much control the mind has over the body and how working on the mental aspect really makes you perform better in all aspects of life. Absolutely. And grit is the prime example of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how um, you now face, if you were to go and do the blindfolded challenge now, what's your strategy now? So, I mean, the the... You know, talking about having grit predicts success on a growth mindset is absolutely critical to it. One, having a growth mindset, it's the psychology of understanding you can get better at anything. And there's no hard upper limit you can get at something. Um, so how do you develop grit then? Like, well, the grit is predicts success. How do you develop? And the way to develop grit is to act gritty. It's just to not give up. Fake it. When you fail. Yeah, you fake it. You fake it till you make it. And, and, and people talk about motivation. I'm like, I, how do you have the motivation to get up and run and do all this stuff? And it's like, well, you don't feel it. You, you create it. Mm -hmm. Like, if you don't want to go for a run, the way to want to go for a run is start to start running. Mm -hmm. It's when you're in that process, you just get up, do it. Go, do it. It's like, don't make an excuse. Like, a lot of the time, I don't want to train. I don't want to lift weights. I don't want to run. I just start doing the thing. And then later with endorphin relief, I get the the reward, the immediate reward for the endorphins. So I'm like, I'm glad I did that and I feel good about it. But you don't necessarily have it. So it's you, you do it. And so you put yourself in those situations. If you're afraid to do something, you put yourself into a safe situation. You're going to do that thing. And then do it again and over and over again and practice a lot. And so when I'm juggling blindfolded, um, <laughs> I still struggle with it a little bit. But I, I actually recently lost the first record I ever successfully broke. So I talked about the fastest half mile run while juggling. I ran 2,000 miles training and I actually failed to break that record. I, because at the end of that 2,000 miles, I hurt my knee. Mm. And they could not figure out what was going on with it. I mean, I went to the doctor, got a second opinion, x-rays, MRIs. They, they couldn't figure it out. And it was a year and a half before I was able to sprint again. And, and one, it ended up being a combination of the shoes I had, a tight IP band, pulling the knee out of joint and, um, and, just overuse injury, uh, so I, I, I can run again now. But I had a choice to make at that point. It's like, do I give up on my dream of breaking a Guinness World Record? Or do I say, hey, I've set this goal, and I want to achieve it. And what I did is I decided to pivot to, I realized I've just spent a couple of hundred hours doing the basic three-ball cascade while running. I can almost do it with my eyes closed. Maybe I should try it with my eyes closed. <laughs> And then I was like, but maybe not while running. Okay. <laughs> so I uh, stood in one place and practiced for several months for the longest duration blindfolded juggling. And in October of 2015, I juggled blindfolded. A previous record was six minutes, 29 seconds. And when I hit that six minute, 29 second mark, the audience of several hundred that were watching me cheered. I got so excited. I immediately overthrew a ball and dropped it. <laughs> broke, <laughs> broke the record by five seconds. Okay. <laughs> but I broke my first Guinness World Records title. Okay. Um, and then uh, I broke that same one again a year later at 22 minutes, then 32 minutes. And then this last year, I actually lost the record. It's the first record I ever broke. I've held it the entire time. I just locked it. Somebody else juggling for 30 or 43 minutes blindfolded. Wow. When you go see your doctors and you say like, look, my forearm is killing me. I just juggled for 10 hours. Does your doctor look at you and say, stop juggling? <laughs> like, what is the feedback? <laughs> that particular record I did not tell the doctor about. <laughs> I didn't go. I was like, I know what happened to my arm. I don't need to see a doctor about this. <laughs> oh, so you knew what was going on. So you self-diagnosed. Well, I mean, I threw a ball 125,000 times and my arm hurt. <laughs> it wasn't sure. much, uh... But that's the thing. Like, it's important for a doctor to be in tune in knowing who you are as a person. Yeah. Because if a patient comes in, has pain in their forearm, and I'm like, well, look, this pain isn't so bad. I'm not really worried anything. But if now my patient is trying to set a world record to juggle for 13 hours straight, my treatment plan is going to be very different. Not that I would necessarily know what to do because like, oh man, how do you prepare someone for that kind of feat? Mm -hmm. But it's important that we adjust to the person sitting in front of us as opposed to just following the guidelines. Well, you know, everything's intact. The MRI mm -hmm. looks good, but can you perform? Mm -hmm. That's an important part of it. I think about um, champions, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan have, have talked about visualization yeah, and imagining yourself being in, in the victorious position. Have you ever used that strategy? All the time. 
all the time. Mm. And and there are studies that show, you know, uh, you know, free throw shooters, for example. You got uh, beginner, intermediate, and uh, expert free throw shooters. And they say, hey, um, what you're going to do is they did a control group for each uh, beginner. Half of you shoot free throws, shoot 100 free throws a day. Other half, visualize yourself doing it. Intermediate, same thing. Expert, same thing. What they found is the beginner free throw shooters that didn't know how to shoot, free, shoot a free throw, the people that actually practiced got much better. Mm. If they just visualized, they didn't get better. The intermediate ones that knew how to shoot a free throw, the ones that practiced got better, but the ones that visualized got better better just as much. Mm. All they had to do was visualize it. And the reason is they knew the proper motion. They knew what they were thinking about. They knew how to visualize what they're doing. And the brain is actually doing those things in the brain, consolidating those memories. The neurons are actually firing. And so since they were doing it right while they thought about it, they improved just as much. Yeah, the neuroplasticity of how the brain adapts to certain situations is so amazing from the visualization standpoint. But also something that I've noticed anecdotally within myself, is if I watch professionals do a sport, perform a task, and then I go do it, I feel like I almost know what I'm doing, even though I haven't done that thing in a really long time. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually just had uh, the blessing of being, being able to play basketball at Madison Square Garden. And I've never done a spin move with a drive to the basket. Like, it's just not something I regularly do. <laughs> but I was watching a game the other day uh, in Madison Square Garden of St. John's, and I'm like, I want to try that move. And I've never done it. This is no mm -hmm. practice, but I saw the person do it. So I said, I'll just do what I visualized. And it happened. Mm -hmm. But it's not because I practice. It's because I watched this gentleman do it <laughs> before me. And it's it's interesting because we actually have done functional MRI studies yep. where we watch an action movie. We watch a sporting event. The same areas in our brain light up as if we're doing those things. Mm -hmm. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, and w and when you're doing something, we talk about muscle memory. That's mm -hmm. the colloquial term for it. But the way I think, actually think about it is the neuron memory. Yep. It's you know the myelin sheath being strengthened along that neural pathway mm -hmm. from when it fires. And when it first starts, the first time you do something, it's like a leaky hose. Yep. That the, the signal doesn't go off from your brain out to the arms to make the action happen. Mm -hmm. and, and then that's where a lot of people give up. They're like, oh, I'm not good at this. I'm, I can't do it. I, I'm not good at making a layup or remembering people's names or you know being good at social conversation. I don't make new friends. But these are all things that can be learned by practicing them. And when you do it for the first time, of course, you're not good at it. Of course, not all that signals making your brain out to where that signal needs to go. But as you perform the action over time, practice it and then sleep on it where those memories are consolidated and the, your brain reperforms those actions while you're asleep, that myelin sheath around that neural pathway becomes stronger so that more of that signal goes the next time and the next time. And so when I'm practicing for record, I'll often start and be like, hey, I'm terrible at this. I'm awful. Can't do it at all. But with a growth mindset and grit and understanding how the brain works, I can practice those things and I know I'm eventually going to get better. And I might hit a plateau somewhere along, along the way. And this happens to uh, folks when they're like, well, I, I tried it. I was okay at it. But then I hit a plateau and I gave up. But if I keep pushing through, I always make it through that plateau. Really? Always make it through that plateau. Yeah. What is your strategy lifestyle factor wise? What do you take into account when you are in training mode? Besides, obviously, repeti re re repetition, repetition, repetition. Yeah, well, uh, repetition and then sleeping on it, and because it's important, it, and and knowing that it takes time a lot of the time. So mm -hmm. right now, in any so given patience, pa yeah, patience, practice, and longevity. Because mm -hmm. at any given time, I'm probably practicing in some way or another for thirty to forty different records per week. Wow. And a lot of it's general fitness, you know, running, balancing, um, lifting weights, that sort of thing. But then I'll practice for the specific action of, okay, I need to blow up so many balloons with my nose. I'm going to work on my lung strength to push out the air through my nose. And I'm going to do the finger strength and I can pull it apart and tie the balloon and that sort of thing. Or I'm doing the little finger squeezy things for, you know, snapping cucumbers or bananas or pencils or records or, you know, there's a lot of overlap between the training. Um, and then sleeping on it and then coming back and practicing the next thing the next week. Um, so, uh, knowing that it takes time and then because like how do you because I set a goal in 2021 of breaking 52 Guinness World Records in 52 weeks you don't do that by picking a new record every week it's like here's the list of records I've got and I need to practice for 20 to 40 per week over the year to make sure it happens how do you deal with the frustration in moments where the mind will creep up and be negative it's just it's bound to happen like for me training boxing I'm like ugh, I'm not seeing the improvement I'm frustrated What's your strategy to talk back to yourself? 
uh, having some positivity is really important. And the other thing is <laughs> I've, I've, especially when I'm trying to break a record in front of, you know, sometimes I've got witnesses and timers there, but maybe not a lot large, large live audience. And so I can try a, you know, a 30 second or a minute record four or five times in a row. And, and I used to just get so frustrated, get mad. And I'd be like, dang it. And like timer, you did something wrong. Or I'm lashing out or just being negative. And my wife's like, here, all these people are here helping you out today and you're not treating them very well. I used to do the same thing while filming videos. Yeah, and and I was like, Jennifer, you're absolutely right. I need to have a better attitude. Uh, treat these people with respect. And what I found actually is if I'm not in that negative mind space, I actually perform better myself. Mm -hmm. And even when I fail, um, if I've got a better attitude towards other people and towards myself, I'm more forgiving and then it makes it easier to come back the next time without that negativity. And the negativity also, you know, makes me more nervous as well as gets me more frustrated. And then it makes it harder to perform. You start thinking about what are those people thinking? Am I upsetting them now? I've upset them. They're going to do the timer wrong. And the brain just starts spiraling at that moment. Yeah. And it, and it's, and it's not helpful. Mm -hmm. Do you have strategies for the positive thinking? Are you doing three positive things at night? Are you talking back to yourself therapy, any of these things? Uh, so we have a, a thing in our house, um, with the kids like, Hey, what are your roses and thorns today? Oh. Or your highs and your lows? What's the, the best thing that happened today and the worst thing. And then we talk about them with the boys and my wife. And it, you know, it's helpful that, you know, when you're in a bad mood, if you can, think of one thing. Yep. And and what I found myself is when my five-year-old's like, I don't know, nothing will happen good today. And I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I have that attitude myself sometimes. Yeah. I don't want to talk about it. When I'm in a bad mood, I want to drag myself back into that mood. But if you can find those positive things to talk about, like, hey, um, you know, for example, this last week I was, you know, I had a videographer in town and I tried to break some world records to get him on film. And actually I did, uh, I broke, I tried 11 world records this last week and I was wow. successful in nine of them. Wow. And I want to focus on those two that I failed at. Uh, but if I think of, wait, no, nine world records in one week, I think that's the most I've ever done. This is, this is awesome. I did great. I don't have to worry about those two that I failed at. When I talk to folks about, well, like actually when we started this conversation, I said that you learn to love failure and you said no one loves failure. It's in the same way when I tell folks you need to make stress your friend mm -hmm. because we've actually seen through really good scientific research that our outlook on what stress is impacts how it impacts us. Mm -hmm. So we've actually done research where we've seen people who have high levels of stress live shorter lives than people who have lower levels of stress in their lives. But then when we stratify them further into people who have high levels of stress, but view stress positively, as in it's getting you ready to overcome a challenge, it's making your body more fit, this is something that's needed for growth mindset, those people, even when you compare them to people who had less stress, they live longer. So it's not only how much stress we have, but also how we view stress. So the more we can view stress as our friend, the more that it's gonna work in our favor. And that's why I said, I feel like when you look at failure, you look at it as an opportunity as opposed to, oh, this is a discouragement for me that I fail. Mm -hmm. Has that always been the case for you or is this something you learn throughout the journey? Yeah, you learn it throughout the journey. And, and you know, breaking world records, I used to get super nervous beforehand. Now, most of the time I don't. A little bit of stress, that's good. A little bit of nerves helps me stay focused and like up to, in the weeks or months leading up to the attempt, if I know there's a big one coming up, it helps me to get me motivated to go out and practice. Like, hey, I need to make sure I'm ready for this. And, it, and it's a lot like, you know, public speaking for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Number one fear for a lot of folks. And it's like, before I get in front of an audience, I get these butterflies in my stomach. There's a point where those butterflies can become debilitating and you can't perform. And most people, when they're talking, they're like, I was so nervous in front of the audience. For the most part, that's not, the audience doesn't even see that. But you feel it way more sure. than you see it. So there's, there's a, a nice balance, like you, you should be nervous before you get up and talk. You mm -hmm. should be nervous because you need to be on point. You need to have your a, a, a little bit of adrenaline or to make sure you're performing and you're thinking about what yeah. you need to do. There's a point where, you know, if you get blackout nervous and you can't think, can't perform, <laughs> can't juggle, that's a problem. But a little bit of stress in moderation absolutely helps with, with performance. So a little bit of stress is good. Acute stress helps us grow. It helps our muscles grow. Carrying weight on our bones helps our bones stay strong. Mental health challenges, short term, are good. When it becomes chronic, it becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes acute stresses can be really bad. When you had your 52 week, 52 world record challenge going on, you had appendicitis. Yes. How the <laughs> hell do you manage that? Not very well. I tell you, I was in the hospital. <laughs> most, <laughs> most painful experience of my life. Okay. And, and part of the reason was I was in the emergency room there. Well, I, 
I'm trying to remember. I, I, I've been in the emergency room a few times for appendicitis, <laughs> meningitis, and, oh and a couple other things. And a, a food poisoning here in New York City once. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't city. eat the hot dog off the street. That was a bad choice. <laughs> so I've got, I've got appendicitis, and I didn't, I didn't know for sure what it was. But I got transferred to the ER, and they're going to perform surgery on me. Um, Are you telling them while this is going on? Telling they, who? They, they, you have like the doctors like, hey, I got to get back to this thing. Oh, no, no, no. I was in so much pain. I just oh, wanted so you to were get, like, I want to live. Yeah, I do. I was like, I want to live. <laughs> and But unfortunately, there was a, a traumatic car crash right at the same time. So there was oh, multiple people in the people, hospital. In you, the hospital, you weren't in the car. So, crash. so anyway, yeah, you know, I'm in the hospital waiting for surgery. But there was a, a car crash where other people were in much greater need than I was. Like the surgery needs to happen immediately, or these people are going to die. So I ended up waiting for hours oh, in the room, in pain, in absolute pain. And I'm I'm literally screaming, "Help! Help!" My wife's sitting there, like I I just I was in so much pain. Eventually, I got the surgery. All was fine. Um, other than I've got, you know, a tube in my stomach and the uh, no appendix. So it's got to heal up. And that healing process, you know, just a couple weeks and I would have been ready to go back to action. But then, but then I got C. diff. Oh, which I, for, for folks who don't know, this is an infection that usually uh, happens after a course of antibiotics where you wipe out uh, a lot of the organisms in your gut. Uh, you have an overgrowth of this Clostridium difficile bacteria, which creates monstrous, phallodorous diarrhea that spreads very easily. It's not a fun experience. It was awful. I mean, it was. I mean, it, it took me months to recover from this in terms of getting my gut health back to where it needed to be and fatigue and issues. So I'm trying to make 52 weeks, but I'm like, well, what record can I break here? So I'm like, well, I got some ping pong bouncing ones. So I'm <laughs> trying to bounce ping pong balls for these records because that's about all I can do. Wow. So mm-hmm. you you were battling multiple medical situations simultaneously, mm-hmm. and you still did it. Yeah, I still made the 52 records in 52 weeks. The la- the final one of the the year was the the furthest distance walked with a running chainsaw balanced on my chin. With a running chainsaw balanced on your chin. That sounds yeah. dangerous. You, you know, I, I bounce a lot of stuff on my chin. <laughs> <laughs> this one is, is one of the most dangerous. Is there something specific? Like, you're looking at records to be broken. Why are you like chin? I feel like I have a solid chin. Why are you thinking chin? Uh, because that, I, I, most of the records that I've broken already exist in the Guinness World Record mm-hmm. database. And so this is, they don't have one for the 400 and those with the chainsaw running on the chin. So it's like, hey, I see this one. I'm ah. going gonna, gonna to apply for it because it's an existing record. Okay. Um, and and a lot of the records have to do with balancing. But if you understand physics, the the rate at something which something tips is inversely proportional to the height of the center of gravity. So basically, the taller, the, the higher the weight is on the object, the slower it tips over. So say, for example, like a broom with a broom on broom head on top or a lawnmower, which I also balance on my chin, with the head on top, it, it tips over slowly. But um, a chainsaw with a heavy motor right next to the chin and a light blade in the air, that actually tips over much faster because of the lower center weight of gravity or you know the other term I use is squirrely. It's a squirrely thing. And then when it's running... Um, it's a it's a two stroke uh, gas motor. It's really shaky right there and in the chin. smelly. It's shaky, smelly. The shakiness is is much more concerned than the smell to me. Okay. Um, I did it outdoors, so I'm not too worried about the carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, okay. <laughs> but when I do this, I'm I'm wearing a helmet, goggles, gloves, Got it. Okay. a big thick jacket, and then a neck gaiter to protect Thank my God. neck as okay, well. Good. Okay. So, so I was trying to have the, and even then I was super nervous about this one. Uh, and so I, I broke the record. I walked 63 meters, and I'm like, yeah, I could probably go 400, but I don't want to do it again right now. <laughs> wow. Have you ever gotten seriously injured trying to perform one? So I've been injured many times during records. Usually it's not during the record attempt itself, um, unless it's kind of like a planned thing. Uh, For example, like the, uh, I've got the record, I had the record for the fastest half marathon skipping. Fastest half marathon skipping. So 13.1 miles, that hop, step, skip, hop, step, skip. I started training for that one. I'm like, where is it okay for an adult to skip? And I started training on a trip to Disney World. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's an acceptable place to so, do it. So this is back when the fast passes, you had to go physically to the ride, put your ticket in and they give you a fast pass. And so yeah. I tell the family, hey, I'll go across the park, get fast passes here and I'll meet you over there. So I'm skipping across the park everywhere <laughs> to get my training in. Uh, but then that skipping motion, the sliding motion of the foot in the shoe, blister just absolute huge, huge oh, blisters and blood foot, blisters. Yeah. yeah, right on the ball of the foot. So how did you treat that? Um, time, you know, it's like, time. well, I can't go skipping for another week now. There is a um, great product on the market called Second Skin. Have you okay. heard about those? Um, it, uh, I th- is that the stuff you, uh, no, tell me about it. It basically like glues on to yeah. your foot, uh-huh. essentially becomes skin until new skin grows on and then it falls off. 
Okay. So you can wear it, shower with it. Do it. You could also put it on blisters, obviously, in the back of your leg mm -hmm. as well. And it stays on for a period of time. There's also ones with padding on them, like colloid ones with like a little fluid inside to help ease some of the padding. But I, I think they work really well because when I grew up, I played soccer a lot. And for some yeah. reason, when I played soccer, the blisters were terrible. Like they would go to the bone. Mm -hmm. So I would put one of those on and it's like, Nothing. It's like you have fresh skin right there. Wow. So I wonder if one of those products would have worked for you. I, I, need, to, I need to defend that record. So I'm going to look into that product because, <laughs> you know, and the shoes that I wear, I can only skip about 30 miles and the sole is completely gone off part of the shoe. Oh my God. Do you get fresh? Do you email the, the people who made the shoe and say, hey, what is, what's going on? <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> what I'll do is I'll use the running shoes. And then once the running is, they're done with the running, I'll then use, repurpose them for skipping, skip the 20 miles and throw got them away. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Are you having to buy a lot of pairs of shoes? Because you know shoes have limited mileage you could put on them, but you're doing such incredible feats. Yeah, I have a, I have a actually a big stack of shoes in my closet because I wait until last year's model goes on sale, buy four or five pairs, and wow, yeah, keep a stack. Do you have to stay with the same shoe to make sure that it's consistent for what you're trying to do? I've I've chosen to, and that's as much out of you know my early injury on like my knee was hurting so bad it was a combination of not having the proper shoe i was wearing like a 20 dollar cheap shoe mm -hmm. and i didn't because i didn't realize the value of having support and arch support and yep. making sure it's you know keeping the proper mechanics and now it's a wear 140 dollar built for purpose running shoe so what shoe are you wearing now i, I wear a brooks adrenaline gts okay solid shoe mm -hmm. very solid shoe when you go through the process of trying to pick a world record or to create a new world record to me, they feel like they're completely made up. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm going to throw this brand of bottle across this room <laughs> for this number of feet. Like, how are the records decided? They feel just random. Yeah, they, they, but they're not. They're definitely not. And there's a list on Guinness's website of what do, what makes for a Guinness World Record title. Oh, what title. is that? And, and, you know, it's got to be specific. It's got to be non-arbitrary. It's got to be breakable. It's got to be relevant. I mean, it's... Hold on, it's like a non-arbitrary? Well, You walk yeah. 63 meters with the chainsaw balancing <laughs> on your chin. So, so... How do you decide arbitrary? <laughs> so the 60... So in that case, it's the furthest distance walked. So it has to be beatable. So if somebody walks 64, they can break it. But that and, doesn't make and, it non-arbitrary. Well, yeah, I guess the non-arbitrary... I should, <laughs> I should look up the... What, what makes a Guinness yeah, World good. Record... Okay. Maybe so it's got to be measurable. So can you measure it? Can you can you measure it or measure it? Measure so it. Some people say measure. I say measure. measure. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've been people who've made fun of me for that. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's just an Idaho accent thing, but I'm just That's saying. That's what it I was wrong. like. Is that an Idaho thing? <laughs> Sam's confused. For as much as I measure things, I measure them a lot. Well, as long as you major measure them. Yeah, yeah. And then is it breakable? Can somebody break the record? Okay, you know? so measurable, breakable. Yeah. And then it's got to be standardizable. Is 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 it possible to set parameters to allow everybody to be able to make an attempt anywhere in the world? And is it verifiable? Can you verify that this happened? Mm -hmm. And is there accurate evidence that will allow it? Uh, and then is it based on one variable? There's only one. Longest, fastest, furthest, highest. Mm -hmm. It can't be most with this or the most fastest or the biggest, tallest. It's It's one variable. Mm -hmm. And then is it the best in the world? Has somebody done better? If so, you've got to do better than that. that would be the minimum mark. Yeah. So for example. So non-arbitrary isn't, isn't part of it. Okay, got it. <laughs> well, because I think about it and I'm like, okay, so can I submit the record of Dr. Laughing to number of memes on my, like on YouTube? That, that probably would. But it's, it meets all those parameters. It's measurable, it's beatable, it's verifiable. We, we have the video of it. And then, and then there's the subjectivity factor of the Guinness adjudicator. Oh, do like, they want a, that? Do they want it? Yeah, got it. They and, prefer the chainsaw. It, yeah, <laughs> I mean, but it's not like it's a just. A, it, it, I think in the database, there's now about sixty nine thousand Guinness World wow. Records. So if you want to break one, y your best bet is to go find one that already exists. Have you ever created one? I've created a few. Really? Yeah. Which ones? Um, for example, the world's slowest juggling, which is defined as the fewest juggling catches in one minute. And yes, you have to be juggling the whole minute. You can't be holding them in your hands or drop the balls. So they all have to be uh, one ball to be juggling three balls. The, three balls. Three, but three balls have to be in the air. So or like, what's the rule? So, so juggling, you've always got to have at least one ball in the air. And one before that one catches, you have to throw the next ball. So one yeah. ball in the air at all times. At least one. Two at the transition point. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So the Guinness, uh, the juggling community, had a record for this. The fewest juggling catches in it. But Guinness didn't have a category for it. So I applied to Guinness and said, "Hey." Um, I think this is, you know, there's the most catches in a minute. Let's do the least catches in a minute with three balls. Here's the current record in the Guinness community. And Guinness said, yep, that's interesting enough. It's verifiable, standardizable, single variable. We'll approve the record. The minimum mark is the current uh, 26 that the juggling community has. 
And what was your strategy to be the slowest? So there's two there's two main pieces of that. One is throw the balls as absolutely high as you possibly can. Oh, okay. So that's the number one. That's the So were you outdoors? Yeah, I did it. I actually made the official attempt on the blue turf at Boise State University. Wow. So outdoors, okay. nice wide open space, so I'm not <laughs> okay. gonna run into things. Yeah. And then an iconic location helps too. And the number the number two piece for the critical for that one is to wait until the last possible moment to throw the next ball. Because you want to minimize the overlap of the balls in the air. Because basically you've got a, a, about a three-second hang time. The longer you wait to throw it, the less the hang times are overlapping. Because mm, if you throw the it. first ball, when the first the second ball, when the first ball is way up in the air, then you've got both balls in the air. Both their clocks are ticking at the same time. Got uh, it. Basically and meaning. what was that record? So I, I had 22 catches in one minute. Okay. And how high do you think you were throwing the balls? Um, I, there was a... Actually, I did the math on this. I think it was about... Uh, a little over 45 feet on average. About one and a half times the height of the uh, field goal post. So that's really, that's pretty high. Mm -hmm. you're, you're really tossing them. And yeah, you, you did a first attempt. Uh, I, I probably tried that 13 times or more. Oh, yeah. on, on the field. On the field, yeah. And I practiced that's hundreds of times before that. And my heart rate for that one, my resting heart rate as a runner is about 50 beats per minute. Mm -hmm. During the record attempt, my heart rate got up to 184 beats a minute. Wow. Yeah. So you were fully zoned in like Like day. every muscle... Throwing with the legs, the <laughs> arms, the the core. Wow! And then um, when you're uh, throwing the balls up in the air and you're catching them, um, have you ever done it where it's like you go to set out an attempt and the first attempt you're like, got it? Yeah, there's often times for records. really you're just doing it off. Well, in practice, usually I practice so much that I know I can do it. And sometimes when I'm actually making the official attempt with all of the witnesses and timekeepers and stuff there, it I, I do it. Yeah. Only a couple times that it happened where the first practice I do something, I did it because um, I can't even think of an example. I know it's happened a couple times, but sure. that, that has happened a couple times. What's, uh, what's the record you're most proud of? So it's the hardest records that I'm most proud of. For example, the, the world's longest duration juggling It's the hardest record i ever set both logistically physically mentally and then the other real hard ones are like i'm the world's fastest juggler it's the most juggling catches in a minute uh and the interesting thing about that one is when i first tried to break it 2015 2016 i didn't really believe i could do it there's thousands of professional jugglers in the world who are way better at juggling than me who am i to think i could become the world's fastest and the funny thing happened is i was like oh, i'm gonna try it so i got my baseline how fast am i and then i practiced for a week or two did it again so i didn't improve i can't do it but then i chose to take this grit and growth mindset to heart and it's like no 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 if i believe i can do it if i believe i can get faster if i work at this with grit i'm gonna break this world record and what i did then is that i'm not gonna try to break this world i'm i am going to break this world record it is now my goal I don't care how long it takes, I'm going to do it. And a funny thing happened when I, when I had that mindset, I practiced and I got a little bit better. And as I got a little better, I believed it more. And the more I believed it, the more I practiced and the more I practiced, the better I got. And I eventually broke that record and became the world's fastest juggler. I got 428 catches in one minute. What? It's over seven catches per second. How, how, uh, uh, when you say you practice, are you recording it and trying to see what movement you can do differently? What's a practice session? Yeah, so deliberate practice is extremely important. Deliberate practice is practicing something deliberately. So I'm getting the practice and then getting immediate feedback. Like, hey, if I change my, if I put my hands closer together, am I going faster? If I go further apart and throw them more sideways, if I hold one hand a little bit higher than the other, how does that affect it? If I use this juggling ball versus this juggling ball versus this juggling ball, which way is faster? And then figure out, okay, timing it, figure out how many catches a second I'm getting, how, how, what's the fatigue level in my arms, and then getting that immediate feedback and going session after session after session. And this whole time I'm working in tech too. So my practice sessions are, you know, uh, lunchtime, after work, and weekends. <laughs> so that's when I, so every day at lunch, I go down to the uh, office, had an in-house gym. I'd often go down to the gym and just be juggling in front of a mirror. Um, so I'm getting that feedback. Uh, and, and so that deliberate feedback and the, uh, deliberate practice with immediate feedback is super, super important to improving, to figure out what's working, what's not working, and then trying harder. Do you think you enter a state of flow when you're performing or practicing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's that time. You're not thinking about anything else. You're not stressed out about life. No, completely blocking out. I mean, and when, when you get to that point, it's just, it's amazing. Cause it's mm -hmm. like, I'm just in the zone, uh, described as flow. And I love it when those times happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of humans. Um, something uh, interesting. Uh, have you ever read a book, uh, The Power of Willpower or The Art of Willpower by Roy Baumeister? Not that one. He's been on this show as well, the author. And 
part of what he talks about is performance artists who stand in the street and don't move and hold certain positions. Uh -huh. And they talk about it not being a physically demanding feat, yeah. but more so mentally. The fact that someone's walking by, the fact that someone is trying to be annoying and that you're thinking about your day and that's what makes you wanna move. And that even though physically it's not super demanding, they come home and they're exhausted oh, yeah. from the mental component of it. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the willpower muscle is something that you lift with? Oh, absolutely. That that ability to realize, hey, I'm in the first five minutes of a four hour record attempt. Man, I have three hours and fifty. If I start thinking about that three hours and fifty five minutes ago, it's defeating. It's like I can't. You, you can't think. So, about what it. do you think about in that moment? Something else. I'll I'll count the number of catches I've got, or I'm thinking about, hey, what's it going to feel like when I accomplish this? Okay. Visualize the prize, the end goal, and when I think about, hey, this is what it's going to feel like when I accomplish it. That makes it much, much, much easier to continue. So silly distractions are not silly distractions. This is a valid coping mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Because when, I, uh, when I'm training for my boxing matches, I'm doing some of these wind sprints and I'm really just gassed. I'm thinking about the kid who bullied me in third grade. Just like <laughs> ridiculous stuff that I've never thought about because I was like, I just need to will it to keep going. Mm -hmm. And then you do it and you're like, wow, I'm totally capable of this. But if you just listen to what your body is saying in the moment, it's like give up. Yeah. What question I have for you, and you may not have thought about it given the amount of failures and then successes you've had. We live in an era where we're trying to put a, a good emphasis on mental health, reduce mm -hmm. mental health stigma. And the term of listen to your body, don't overwork yourself, don't get to the point where it's destructive. How do you balance getting to that point where you're listening to your body and you're not overdoing it and you're not pushing it, but at the same time, setting new feats and telling your body, hey, I'm distracting. Um, I, I, I set a goal. I don't care. Yeah. So there's, that's very important. And, and I do think about that on a regular basis because, you know, sometimes the mental state, you know, I've, I've had, you know, depression at times in my life where I just don't feel like doing anything. I mean, and lasting for months, it's not just a sad day, but I've, uh, you know, it's, it's tough to get through that. And it's just a matter of get up, do it, get help, you know, make sure you've got a support group, family, friends to come around you. And, uh, and for the last several years, I've been in a great state and my mental capacity has been there. But, um, when I'm, I think about that more on a physical aspect, like I'm working my body really hard because I want to be able to accomplish this thing. I need to be able to sprint a hundred meter dash while juggling blindfolded faster than anybody else ever has before. And to do that, I have to be out there doing wind sprints on a regular basis. And I want to be able to push my body to the limit to make sure I'm going to have a, a great recovery and be stronger and faster next time. But what I'm, I'm listening to my body there is, is it just like, you know, physical pain from overexertion or I'm actually injured? Because if I'm injured, I've got to stop. How like, do you decide that? Like what, what's your secret? I, you know, <laughs> doing it over and over again to realize, hey, is this just a problem or an injury? I've uh, oftentimes tight uh, hip flexors. And when I hit, hit those, I'll need to stop and stretch. I'm like, okay, if I sprint more, I'm actually going to injure this versus am I just using this as an excuse to stop training because my lungs are hurting? Mm -hmm. um, and it's so just you're a matter checking of, in with yourself yeah, and really evaluating. With, yeah. And, and sometimes it's, oh, I can feel my, my, um, hamstrings about to pop because I pulled that a couple times playing soccer. Mm -hmm. I got to stop sprinting, especially because it's 32 degrees outside and I need to take a break versus, you know, some, I, I practice for balancing things on my chin for a long time for like a lawnmower stuff. But when I'm training, I actually use a, a, a barbell, like a hand barbell, but I put like 40 pounds of weight on one end and a tennis ball on the other and put the tennis ball on my chin. And what, what hurts when I first starting that is my jaw, my jaw goes out first and then the neck gets really tight and it hurts. But the one that's really, really scary for me is actually the lower back. Because that doesn't hurt until the next day. Mm. <laughs> so that's over trial and error, realizing, hey, when I'm starting to ramp up my training for balancing things on my chin, it's the lower back that I'm most at risk of hurting, and it's what doesn't hurt when I'm doing it in the, in the moment. Mm -hmm. So I have to ramp that training up over time to avoid the lower back pain. How do you decide what your ramp up protocol is? Trial and error. Okay. Yeah. So what what have you learned that works well for you? How how do you increase it? Do you go ten percent? Do you is it time focused? Is it weight focused? It's 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 weight and time focused. Either mm -hmm. I'll start with thirty pounds and then I make sure to do a nice warm up. The first balance will be fifteen seconds, then forty five, and then maybe a minute and a half. And then it's not until I've trained for two or three weeks that I can try to put that forty pound weight on my my chin for two or three minutes. The reason I'm asking you these questions is because 
I feel when I see these hyper optimizers, biohackers on podcasts, are like, this is the protocol. This is how you got to lift. This is how. And me being someone who lives in the real world, and why I say real world, because I feel like those people are taking it to an extreme that it ends up being outlier stuff. Most people, the way you get good at all these things is just consistency. Yeah. It's just showing up. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest thing. Not how long you did it, not which diet you followed, which exercise. If you just show up and do it, you're going to be ahead of 99% of people. Do you feel like that's a fair assessment? Yeah. I mean, the hardest part of doing something is getting started. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And the second hardest part is finishing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and something when people are like, well, well, what is a hack? And it's like, well, if you think about hacks, I feel they should be targeted to make the starting point easier. Mm -hmm. So if that means putting... Uh, like Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank was on this podcast and she said she makes sure to put her athletic shoes near her bed so when she gets out of bed, she puts them on right away. So it's like, I already have my shoes on, I might as well go. Yep. It's things that will expedite the start that might be a hack that you could use. Have yeah. you used any hacks so, like that? So one of the things I really love efficiency, mm -hmm. like as an engineer and you gotta love you that, know, right? with a limited amount of time, you gotta be efficient. So I worked in downtown Boise. It was about a 20 minute drive away, nine miles. But I'm like, hey, if I bike to work, I can get exercise during my commute and I can avoid the traffic coming <laughs> sure. home. And so it, it only takes me about 32 minutes to bike. So it's only an extra 10 minutes and I get the exercise out of it. So what I do is I have the shoes and the bike clothes right there ready to go in the morning when I wake up. And then I don't check the weather. I just go. And then when it got cold, <laughs> <laughs> like, what if it's colder? Are you got to dress differently? So, so yeah. So I've got, you know, for the cold, I've got layers and I've got the, the bike jacket and then the different set of gloves. And when it gets down to that temperature, I actually have to like, Hey, which gloves do I wear? Is it 30 degrees or 20 degrees? Okay, it changes the gloves. And then as I'm going, which layers do I take off? And then I did it enough times. I just know what to wear when I get up and then just go, um, and just making it easy to, to have that habit. And it, for a while there, I was uh, biking. And so what I did is I actually, you know, I have my phone on the charging nightstand and there was a Peloton there next to the bed. And what I would do is like, before I can check my email in the morning, I have to be on the bike. So I just get up, literally roll out of bed, hop on the bike, and then I'm checking my email, reading the news wow, in the morning. Okay. And, and you know, still over, getting your blood moving and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's really good. What's your take on, um, I don't know if you're familiar with them, like the David Goggins and, and these people that are He's insane. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've i got my YouTube channel, Record Baker Rush, and I'll laugh and it's like, this guy's the David Goggins of juggling. Yeah, well, that's why and, I see. And, and he punishes his body more than I think I'm willing to. Because, you know, if I'm if I'm running to the point my foot's broken, it's going to set me back in so many other places that I don't, I don't want to make that sacrifice because it's going to cost me 10 other records I can't break anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and your actual life. Yeah. Like family and all of these factors are so important mm -hmm. in setting all these records. Yeah. Like I, I can't say because it's not a validated thing of what is the greatest uh, benefit to ha you having your success or not benefit. What is the greatest factor that's led to your success with juggling? But for mental health, the thing that gives us the best outcomes in the people who have the best outcomes, it's having a support system. Oh, absolutely. That's the factor that like we really try and hammer home. So, I mean, without a support system, I would not be able to do what I what I did. I have a, my, my wife, Jennifer, is the most supportive person in the world. I could not do what I'm doing without her. And, and even the days, sometimes, you know, she has bad days too. And I'm trying a record attempt for the eighth time when I told her it's only going to take five and she's tired of that it's taken longer than it should. And we got family time and I got to clean the, the dishes and get ready for people to come over. And when she's, projecting that negativity because she's got a bad attitude because I've not met my end of the bargain, yeah. that makes it 10 times harder for me to continue. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say I couldn't continue and couldn't do those things. It just is that w one extra barrier. It's the shoes being across the room instead of being by the bed that gives me one extra chance to quit. So when she's supportive, I'm way, way, way better off. And I worked in tech at Crater Point for you know 13 years. And the, the executive staff there, the managers there were really supportive of me, um, breaking records. And I was talking about STEM education and the importance of, you know, kids doing well and talking about how Create a Point is a great tech company in Boise. So I'm bringing a benefit to them, but they were also supportive of me. If they said, you know, we don't want to make these YouTube videos anymore, like they, Apple told Mark Rober, and he eventually quit. Yeah. Uh, he, well, he he actually he kept making YouTube videos, yeah. and then he quit Apple because YouTube was super successful. Exactly. <laughs> Has the journey to getting all these records and having some of them broken 
contributed to your hunger for wanting to set or hold the current amount of world records and that be a world record. All right, so you you heard my my 2024 goal. Yes. Um I my 2024 goal is to hold the most concurrent Guinness World Records okay. titles. And that's probably my most ambitious goal yet. You know, 2021 goal was 52 records in 52 weeks. This is to hold the most. And that's hard cuz you're setting records, but then other people might be taking some of your records. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's like happening on both ends. Yeah. So I'm one person trying to set the records and there's 7 billion people out there that could be trying to take them. <laughs> and hopefully after this interview, there's going to be even more competition. People are going to be like, oh, we're going to set out to make 2024 I, a challenging I hope year there's, for you. I hope there's more viewers and subscribers and less competition. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not going to happen. Well, what are, what are some of the challenges you've set forth in 2024 to make that a reality? Yeah. So uh, there's some, some records, like one recently I just did was the the furthest soccer header okay. um i i played soccer my whole life my favorite sport i probably spent as much time doing that as juggling but i hold 40 juggling world records and zero soccer wins so <laughs> the the furthest distance that had a soccer ball into a target so that requires someone kicking the ball at you so you can either self throw it it can be thrown at you or kicked at you and so i tried practicing for all those the kicking at me is the hardest one <laughs> you gotta but that's the one you're gonna get the most distance po yeah possibly uh the trick is it's got to be into a small target and so if you don't have enough accuracy, uh, your head's going to wear out before you um, yeah, that's get it gotta into the target. Yeah, that's got to be like concussive. I was a little bit concerned. You know, actually, I wasn't concerned enough about this one until after I bro <laughs> broke the record. Because uh, I had what I, what I settled on is uh, the person throwing it at me with an overhead throw, um, like a throw-in, was accurate enough and provided enough power that I could hit it the full 16 meters to, to break the current record of 15.1. But it still took over 90 tries. And the That's force, a lot of shaking. Yeah, the force required to get it over 50 feet um, left my head hurting more than I expected, even the next day. Yeah. And so this is one I was actually, like a lot of the times when I'm, you know, slicing kiwis with a Swiss, with a samurai sword and a Swiss ball, I'm thinking about, this is dangerous, super, super sharp sword, pointy end, if I fall off, I got to pale myself. For the soccer one, I've headed soccer balls my whole life. I didn't think about it until the next day. I was like, man, how dangerous is this? Did I, did I give myself a concussion doing this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The answer is probably yes. Like a minor one. Yeah. Because concussion really doesn't have a, like, it's not something you get imaging. You're like, yeah, you have a concussion. Mm -hmm. It's symptoms. It's what happened mechanism of injury. Uh -huh. And in your situation, yeah, your brain got rattled around and you had symptoms. Concussion. <laughs> <laughs> it's a concussion without loss of consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt that the first time I did sparring where I had full headgear on and all of this, and it was very mild. And I was, mm -hmm. it was just like my entry into the boxing sparring world. And I got some light jabs thrown my way. And I'm like, the next day, what the hell? My head hurts so much. The mm -hmm. brain doesn't like to get rattled. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, most of the pain was on my forehead, like the skin and the bone here. Okay. Uh, so it was more superficial. But So it wasn't there's... like a full Yeah, it wasn't a full headache. headache. It was just like, this is bruised right okay. here. Okay, so mm -hmm. maybe a little bone bruise. Yeah. Because bones themselves don't really feel pain. Yeah. It's the periosteum that covers the bone that really causes the pain. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why a lot of times when you break a bone, it's more nausea than pain. Have you ever done any records that make it that you're consuming a lot of food or liquid in a given moment where it's like really tough? So uh, two of the records I've broken is the fastest time to drink a liter of lemon juice through a straw. So it's- My, my uh, saliva just started going. Mine too. Every time I talk about it, I think about it. Um, Have you practiced this already? I, I, I bro I've, I've held the record before. What? So I uh, I did it. I It's a straw. I drank the <laughs> lemon juice in 16.62 seconds. And then I lost <sighs> the record. Um, at 16 seconds. And actually, I've just made an attempt at it again. And I and I did it this time in just under 14 seconds. This time, though... Do you throw up after? This time I did. Okay, I was gonna... <laughs> I think I got maybe a quarter of it out. But then I've got a stomach ache for a little while. Is and, and I'm like, is this a health risk for me? Is having that much acidic stuff in my stomach an issue? Some people say it is. Some people say it's not. I I'll put it this way. Is it outside the norm of what the human body experiences? Yes. It's not something that the body is ready for. Is it a terrible risk where you're like destroying your body? Probably not. Okay. Yeah. And it's a strong- Because so gastric the... acid is so powerful as an acid that like lemon juice is up there, but okay. you know, the gastric acid hangs out there all the time too. I'm surprised you don't get like a sore throat or um, 
Like a hoarse voice afterwards. Well, actually, this time when I was spraying out the lemon juice, I had the, all these bubbles at the top. Mm. And so I decided to slurp those bubbles out with a straw and it went to the back of my throat and I'm like coughing oh, before yeah. I'm making the record attempt. It's all sort of like, <clears throat> I'm like, dang it, I'm trying to make a record attempt and I can't hard to breathe. And then you do that with lemon juice or lime juice? So or? lemon juice is one record and then lime juice is another. So I just bought the lime juice, but I haven't made that record attempt okay. this year. Okay, so, so that's, that's coming. That's coming because... I was like, What's man, that current record? It's it's right uh, a little over 16 seconds. Okay, so you could beat that. And so I think it, it should be about the same as the lemon juice. The last time I did the lime juice afterwards hurt a lot worse than the lemon juice. Why? I don't know. I wonder if there's a pH difference between the two. Mm -hmm. There probably is. But I practice with water. <laughs> <laughs> Would you ever find yourself making entry into the competitive eating space? I hate the eating records. Why? <laughs> because they hurt the stomach. I don't just, <laughs> just that much food, that and much juggling food. doesn't hurt the arms? <laughs> I mean, not the same way. The, really? The, the arms is like, hey, I feel like I've accomplished something. That physical strength stuff, it feels good to accomplish something with physical strength or, or you know, speed. Mm -hmm. But just the stomach expanding that fast is a pain that I know isn't good for me. So mentally, I'm like, I don't like this pain. I'm not, it's not making me stronger. It's Got not making it's me better. It's an organ visceral thing. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. The, the eating records I do have, though, are like the most peas eaten in one minute with a toothpick. So stabbing the peas one at a time eating with it. So that's more of a mm. speed-based record, and the amount of peas I can eat in a toothpick doesn't overexpand my stomach. So your fine motor control has got to be through the roof. It, it is a practice skill, yes. Mm -hmm. So does, does setting all these records help you be a better human? The one place I, I see it all the time is anytime I drop something, you know, open the fridge and like the glass jar falls out, yeah. I catch everything. Wow. Yeah. Like it's, it's just, Your I mean, I surprised. It's gotta be that. And, and, and even if it's below my caching, I'll catch it with my foot. Or, what, what or, about that? Um, you know, um, boxers do that training where they drop the tennis ball and they have to catch it. You probably oh, crush that. Oh yeah. Those, those I practice that and like, you know, the reaction time stuff. I love those exercises. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, those visual fields where you have to like tap the thing at Dave and Buster's. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done one of those? Yeah, yeah, I do those. Did I you do crush those with my kids. I don't know if I crush them, but I do pretty well at them. Yeah. There is actually some research being shown that being a competitive person at that makes you less likely to get a concussion in NFL. Okay. Because you're more likely to have spatial awareness that if a hit is coming, you can brace for it. Yeah. I thought, part of the danger is. I thought it's because you were practicing at David Buster's instead of playing in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true as well. <laughs> um, but that, that that does help a lot. Because I feel when I'm in the boxing ring, the, the shots that hurt the most are not the most powerful ones, mm -hmm. are the ones you don't see coming. Yeah. Where you don't brace for it, and mm -hmm. it comes from low, you didn't see it, and you get hit, oh, that just is brutal. Yeah. Very painful and really unhealthy to do, I should probably say, because <laughs> it's not great that a doctor is recommending people to do that. So I yeah. don't I don't recommend that. Yeah. Yeah. I almost had a bad injury once um, that would have got me good. It was it was I was trying to run the fastest mile while juggling blindfolded. And and so I've got a blindfold on. I found a big, long street. And what I did is I had a car driving in front of me with the trunk open so I could run after it and the cameraman could be in it. Mm -hmm. They accidentally stopped and I kept running and almost ran into that. <sighs> And I'm like, that would have been me running at six minute mile pace right into a door open. So you set that record? I did set that record, but I said, "Car, you go way the heck out." <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't even so, zoom. So zoom. The, yeah, the cameraman <laughs> can barely see me, but I know those running with me. Wow. The side, so. Oh my god! So you yeah. have the fastest mile blindfolded. Yeah. I can't close R while my... juggling. You were juggling too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on the treadmill the other day, and I close my eyes for two seconds, and I can't stay on the treadmill uh -huh. without falling off going side to side but you're <laughs> setting records doing that yeah. how much harder is it blindfolded uh i would say significantly because i don't think anybody is else it is a speed it slows you down speed wise or uh, just makes it difficult so coordination wise it's it's most of the coordination piece and then the other big piece is you, you gotta stay on the road sure so i had people running next to me and then telling me like just visually create the road it's five lanes tell me if i'm lane one two three four five try okay. to stay in lane three so if they tell me four i need to drift to the left tell me two i drift to the right and, and i would practice on the treadmill so i'd get a nice even cadence running and juggling on the treadmill mm -hmm. and then try to close my eyes for five ten seconds to are you a good dancer I have pra I I really enjoy dancing. I do some swing dancing. I grew up square dancing. I actually I actually do a little square dance calling because my okay. dad did that when I was a kid. So I knew some of the calls. Yeah. I feel like that's got to help with the cadence stuff, like staying on the same pace. 
Because I'm terrible at that, and I'm a terrible dancer, and I feel like that contributes. Uh, yeah, staying yeah on a treadmill helps. Uh, for that one though, I was probably running a little over six minutes, six thirty mile pace. Um, if I run too fast, the arms get you know oxygen deprivation and get shaky at the end. Um, but then I drop the ball probably ten times during that mile, and so when that happens, you have to pick up the ball, go back to where you dropped it, uh. put the blind fuck on, restart. And so one of the restarts took him like four or five tries to restart. Wow. <laughs> so that ate up most of that extra what time. What balls do you use? That's a weird question. Juggling balls. That. Like, what yeah. is that? So I use um, G Balls E8 Pros for most of my juggling records, except for Speed Ball, I use N8. And the, the way I found those, actually, is before I ever broke a world record, I was on a Disney cruise, and I met a professional juggler, Niels Dunker, who's now like the president of the International Juggling Association. But I met him on the cruise, never broken a world record. He had three of them. So I was like, hey, I'm trying to train for my first world record, but I developed a horrible allergy to my juggling balls because most juggling balls are filled with millet, which is a seed that I developed a horrible allergy to during college. Mm. And so it started like- Maybe my... it was a sign from above that you- <laughs> uh, Maybe it was. I mean, it, it, it got me stopping juggling okay. for like 10 years because it was, it went from like, I get a little sniffly after an hour session. What to, was the point of having the millet in there? So the millet is the filling for the ball. It just feels good. It makes it squishy, takes it round. It's got a good mm -hmm. rebound. So, so it's a squishy ball. So it's, a, I mean, it's a little bit, it's not, it's not super squishy, but it's like got a little bit of What's the consistency? Is it like a hockey ball or a baseball, like tennis ball? Like uh, It's a, it's a bean. I've got it. It's a, like a, it's a, kind of like a bean bag, but a little bit stiff. Like a, like hacky, a, a very, hacky sack? A very round, full hacky sack. Yeah. Okay, got it. So it's got a little bit of give. Um, and then in millets, I mean, you can have like stage balls that are hard plastic or bouncy ones, but the ones I like are like, just got a little bit of squish to them, a little bit of give, uh, made of leather, but I developed a horrible allergy, to my juggling balls. And he said, Hey, um, I've got these, these juggling balls that are filled with a plastic bead. They're really nice leather, uh, or fake leather. And he, the reason he liked them is because they're plastic instead of millet because the seeds have import restrictions when you travel globally. Mm. And I actually had my juggling balls confiscated when I went to New Zealand once. They the took millet. your balls? Yes. Ugh. And and I got there like midnight. I've been traveling all day across the country, and the import person is like, do these juggling balls by happen to be filled with seeds? And I was thinking there, well, if I tell her yes, I'm going to lose them. If I tell her no, she's going to cut them open. So I have to tell her yes, they're filled with seeds because they are, and they took and them. And they took yeah. them. Yeah, wow, yeah. that's messed mm -hmm. up. Have you ever thought about launching your own balls? God, these questions. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I, 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 as a keynote speaker, I've created a juggling workshop okay. to talk about, hey, when you're developing a new skill, it's difficult. You struggle at it. And this happens in the corporate world when you're trying something new for the first time. And so learning how to juggle is an analogy to learning a new skill. It's hard when you start, but through practice and deliberate practice and creating your own memory, you can get better at anything. And so I've got some some mid-range, decent record breaker rush juggling balls I, I give out at those events. Got it, got it. Is there a world record for teaching someone who's never juggled to juggle? Can you I, teach me? I, I could teach you how to juggle. I don't think there's how a record for How fast do it. you think you could teach me how to juggle? That's, with with somebody like with record. decent coordination like yourself. I don't have good coordination. I don't know. You're a boxer. I mean, it's okay. It's okay. I, you know, the fastest I've seen somebody that says they didn't know how to juggle was probably between 15 minutes and, and 60 minutes. Okay. My seven -year -old, so it takes time. My seven-year-old right now is trying to learn, and he's... He just got it. He called me this morning and said, I learned how to juggle today. Wow. But he's been practicing for a year. Okay, but that's a different yeah. age thing. You're still mm -hmm. learning your body and stuff. Okay, so you're saying I can learn. Absolutely. Okay. Anybody There's can learn anything new. But you're within the hour. If if you're dedicated to it and focused. And yeah, balanced. yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe after this we're going to do it. But I know you set a world record with a good friend of mine, Howie Mandel. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you went on America's Got Talent mm -hmm. and you tried to set a world record. And we were successful. Well, wasn't there a time before that? So uh, I broke the record for the most fist bumps in 30 seconds. Okay. And that record actually went viral. Okay. And Howie Mandel is, you know, a germaphobe, only does fist bumps. So yes. it only made sense to try to attempt at the fist bump record with Howie on America's Got Talent. Got it. Was there a time that you went on America's Got Talent and didn't set a world record? The, the time before, I actually went on America's Got Talent. We did I did a t-shirt ripping contest with Terry Crews. Oh, okay. So it was the most t-shirts worn and torn in one minute. <laughs> so we each, so Terry put on 30 t-shirts, I put on 30 t-shirts, uh -huh. and then we had to rep them off one at a time. Uh, the previous record was 28, and I got 29 ripped off in, in, in a minute. Oh, so you yeah. did set it. So okay. I did break the record. Okay. Now what happened, so Terry Crews almost beat me. But he admitted afterwards he was ripping multiple T-shirts at a time. Oh, uh, you're he's not strong. allowed to do that. Yeah, you're not allowed to do that for the world record. So okay. he almost beat me on the show. But then what happened is I was so focused on breaking the world record, I forgot to practice my speech of what are you going to wow us with next? 
And so I bumbled through that whole section. And and after I saying offering seven or eight options for records, I finally found up a good one. Howie Mandel's like, yep, I'm good to go. Heidi Klum was a yes. And then um, Howie Mandel, on that time, he said no. When I did the fist bumps with him, he said yes. But it was Sophia Vergara. It was literally her first day ever being a judge on uh-huh. America's Got Talent. And she was on the fence. Like, I kind of liked it, kind of didn't. But my next record involved Kiwis. And so her tie break was, I don't like Kiwis, so no. So I broke the record, but didn't make it on to the next round Got by it. a very tight no vote. Fair, fair. How many fist bumps did you and Howie get? I want to say like 383 in 30 seconds. Is that right? I have to look it up. I don't remember. That sounds in 30 seconds. I, it, it doesn't sound right. Maybe 283. It know. can't be in the hundreds. 380. 380. How in, I in got how long? 30 seconds. 380 fist bumps? I was moving so fast. You were moving faster than the speed of light. The judges didn't think they could see me moving, and they said no. So our cameras wouldn't even be able to capture that. You need a slow oh, motion absolutely. camera. Three, 380 and 30 seconds, that's what? Uh, a, a little over 12 a second, and your frame rate's going 30 or 60 times a second, so you should be able to get 5 to 10 frames per, per fist bump. You can catch that, absolutely. Dan, what do you think? Can we beat it? For everyone listening, we're about to start pounding fists. <laughs> Gentlemen, Four, three, two, one, time. I think we have a record. Come on. Um, How'd you I was feel? counting. He's like, one. You were counting? There's no way. You counted it? If he gets this accurate, Eight. I would be more impressed than that over the record. I think we got it. No way. No, I was going one, two, three, four. three, four. Okay, well, folks, you learn how to set world records because now you got some competition in all these viewers. Mm-hmm. You also learned that failure is an opportunity to be great. Yep. It's a, a failure does not define you how you respond to it does because failure is an opportunity to improve. And the reality is everyone fails and the most successful people fail m- way more than they succeed. Yeah. They put themselves in uncomfortable situations because when you're at the edge of your limits, that's when you're learning. Yeah. Success, I forgot who said this, but success in public is done by the work done in private, right? Yeah. That's like, yeah. that's the real opportunity. But what people don't see is all the times that you struggle waking up in the morning. You're like, I don't want to do this, but you still go out and do it. Mm-hmm. And those are the opportunities that I hope people treasure. Because if you don't enjoy the journey, you shouldn't be doing it, right? The journey is the fun part. The journey gives, I mean, the things that I've worked hard at are the, the hardest at are the ones I'm most proud of for sure. And it's the result is nice, but the whole journey was fun, growth, like the failure, the overcoming the failure. That's the exciting mm-hmm. stuff. The ex- I mean, journey, the journey is what makes the... I don't know what I was going to say. The journey makes it worthwhile. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's very true. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're excited to see the 2024 journey continue and uh, for you to hold all the concurrent records. You have to have all of them (laughs) at once. Where do you want people to follow you? So uh, Record Breaker Rush is my handle. I've got a YouTube channel, Instagram, TikTok, Record Breaker Rush to follow along my journey of holding the most concurrent Guinness World Records titles in 2024. Official update, David and I have been recognized as world record holders for the most alternate fist bumps in 30 seconds, team of two. That means I am calling you out, Howie Mandel, your move. Click here to see me react to Guinness World Records that confuse doctors like myself. And as always, stay happy and healthy.